So today we are starting a new series called The Five Thresholds. Of course, that raises some questions. What kind of thresholds are we talking about? And uh, so I've subtitled it, Understanding How People Come to Faith in Jesus. How is it that people make that journey? We're all on a journey at different speeds, different race. We tell different stories. They're unique. And yet there are some surprising uh, consensus. Uh, a major study was done a few years ago by InterVarsity Christian Press in which they investigated the stories of how people come, came to know Jesus. And there was a surprising consensus. And so they came up with this concept of the five stages or five uh, thresholds that are common to people's story. Uh, I'm, I decided to, in this series, to invite some people up to uh, tell a little bit about their story, and so today is the first one. Um, and so I'm going to ask uh, Ray, uh, Ray Payton, to come up and tell us a little bit about his story and, and his journey of faith. So, All right. Thank you, Steve, and happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, like many of our stories, uh, the journey of the faith in Christ starts even before us. For me, I, I stand on the shoulders of my parents and even a lineage that even goes back further than that. But specifically, my, uh, my parents came to faith in Jesus um, through a, a revival that was just at the tail end in Regina, Saskatchewan. And that decision for them really changed the, the path of their life and even our family life as you know, we would learn and hear stories later on as kids. Um, but so as I tell this story, you know, their influence and their decisions stemming from their following Jesus really influenced my story. Um, so jumping to my story, it was Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, probably July, I would assume, because it was summertime. Um, and I was four or five years old. My sister and I had been attending a backyard Bible club uh, in the summertime. And that one day we came home, and I remember I was sitting on the edge of my sister's bed. My dad was beside me, and my sister, who's 14 months older than me, was beside him. And we brought a tract home that day. And that tract was the, the gospel message. You know, it told us that we had a broken relationship with God the Father, and it was because of the wrong things I'd done, I'd said, or the things I didn't do that I should have done that had broken that relationship, and that God acted by sending Jesus to fix it. And so at the end of going through the tract, my dad explaining a little more to us, answering questions that we had, he asked, do you want to follow Jesus? And at that moment, we sa I said yes. And both my sister and I, in the same day, in that same room, prayed to accept Jesus as our Savior. Now you think, what does a four-year-old or five-year-old really get about this? And that's a great question. Not much. But here's what I did know. One, I knew Jesus loved me and that he did something for me that I needed. I also knew that I wasn't perfect, and I didn't need to understand all of God's holiness, all of his character to understand that. Because by that age, I'd already been well acquainted with a bar of soap <laughs> that I knew that I couldn't even keep my parents happy. How much more could I keep God happy? So I understood because of their teaching and the life that they'd built around us that the, that, that tie from the discipline and the love tied to God's love and God's discipline and why I needed him. It wasn't until high school, though, that that faith really became my own. And again, because of the family dynamic that we had, um, it, it fed into my life. Uh, every year at our church, we had a missions conference. And it wasn't just a one-night missions conference. It was a week-long event. The church was transformed. Missionaries who were home on furlough would share their stories. And those were transformational times for me as a, as a young man, a teenager, hearing stories about what God was doing around the world and seeing that God is bigger than the little corner in my little life and that I can be a part of something bigger, a part of what he's doing. And so there were always altar calls or uh, opportunities to commit your life to following Jesus wherever he wants to take you. And so that, that was instrumental to me. And then also a, uh, every year there was a, a youth conference 
uh, at the Bible College in Regina, where the churches from the denominations from all over Canada would come in. And they would bring in special speakers and events. And that created for me a safe place to ask questions where there was doubts and uh, fears about, did I, do I really believe this? Is Jesus really true? Is everything that I've heard all these years right? It created a safe place for me to ask those questions and really come to terms with saying, yes, Jesus is who I need. What the Bible says is true. And it all stems really from this, you know, going back to that, my parents making a decision to follow Jesus at the end of a revival, changing the trajectory of uh, the, their lives, fed into my life. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for sharing a little bit of your journey of faith and the impact that's had in your life. And for generations, it has had a huge impact. So very cool to see. And I don't know if you see yourself in some of that story. Maybe you've had some of those same questions. Maybe you wished you had become a Christian at a younger age because of some regrets you carry. But, but maybe you did. Maybe it was in a camp situation for you too. Um, there's some things that are similar, some things that are different maybe to your story. In fact, some of you maybe say, I don't even have a story. And this is new to me. And, and so this series will be a, a good one for you also. And we're glad that you're here because maybe you'll, in seeing other people's journeys, it will help you discern your need and, and how you can join in this journey. So we, uh, we start into that together. But I want to, I want to go back because... Uh, Ray touched on a point that was pretty significant, and that was his, of his parents. And, and this is a, a, a very interesting uh, point because often our backgrounds uh, and the things that have happened in the past help to shape our stories, right? Isn't that true? Stuff, your history has shaped you to being the person you are today. And, and we see that's true. And so I want to go back and tell sort of a, the story before the story. I want to take you back to the year uh, 4 B.C., that's going way back in time, and I want to tell you about an event that took place in the towns of Sepphoris and Jishchala. These were two towns in northern Israel, and um, they, they were known as a hotbed for radicals. They called them zealots back in those days. These were Jews who were very strongly Jews and opposed to Rome. Rome were the big guys in the world. Rome ruled the world, uh, took taxes uh, from the people of Israel, and so there was a great deal of animosity. And, and one of these places where the zealots um, were centered was in northern Israel, northern Galilee area, at a, in the towns around Sepphoris and Gishkala. And, and the interesting thing, um, uh, one, one thing is that Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was actually born in, in Sepphoris, uh, which is only seven kilometers northeast of Nazareth, so it's in that same area. Mary was born in, in, in uh, Sepphoris, but ended up going to Nazareth, and maybe part of the reason was about it because of the story that I'm about to tell you. Um, but in 4 BC, <clears throat> there was an uprising. We don't have a lot of the details of this story. Uh, in fact, uh, Gishchala is not even mentioned in the Bible anywhere. Uh, that's probably why you never heard of it, right? Even those of you who have been around Christianity quite a bit have never heard that. But something happened around 4 B.C. that, that uh, the Romans who were collecting taxes, they, uh, they would store it up, and there was these, like, storage areas, and there was a theft that took place. And they, uh, they had broken into the Roman um, treasury, and stolen the money that they, the Romans had taken from the Israelite people, and they'd stolen it back, and, and were, were giving it back to the people. And, and so Rome heard about this, and under the uh, Roman authority, a guy named Varus, he was the Roman governor of Syria at the time, and, and he, uh, he decided he was going to stop this radical movement, these uprisings that were taking place, uh, and, and Rome was no rookie when it came to dealing with insurgents. I mean, they, they had a heavy hand. And so they moved into these areas, completely destroyed uh, Gishchala, burned the city to the ground. And we don't even know where it is anymore. It's like 
we have no clue where this, this town used to exist. Sepphoris, we know, there's an excavation at that site, but another city that, that was uh, burned, uh, a few of them at this time. <clears throat> In fact, they crucified 2,000 people, if you can imagine how horrible that was. It was a pretty significant time. And many of the others were taken as prisoners. Um, and, and became slaves in the Roman Empire. And the only reason we really know about this is because of uh, some people, uh, that some Ro- a Roman source, um, Josephus, but also there was uh, some Christian writers who wrote about this, one being Jerome. And, and he wrote a number of years later uh, about this, and this is, this is what he said about that, that period. He said, the parents of the Apostle Paul were from from Gischala. And that when the whole region was devastated by the hand of Rome and the Jews scattered throughout the world, they were moved, the parents of Paul, uh, of Tarsus, uh, they were moved to Tarsus, a town of Cilicia. And that's where we know, and we pick up the story, because if you know much about Paul and his story, he tells people that he was from Tarsus. In fact, we sometimes call him Saul of Tarsus. Well, his parents, his parents were there and had been a part of this revolt, had experienced the attack, and were taken as slaves back to Tarsus. That's where Paul grew up. So think about that a moment. Uh, There's a couple things there. We don't know for certain, but it's very likely that Paul's parents were part of this zealot movement, or certainly very aware of it. It was what was going on. The anti-Rome sentiment. And that uh, anti-big guy, you know, uh, attitude towards the Roman Empire. He he was also brought up in uh, a slave culture. Interesting. I have another one, another guy named uh, Photius. This is, Photius was the bishop of Constant, Constantinople in, uh, later on, the years 800. And he was reading, and we believe it was all, he was quoting, we're not sure who he was reading at the time, but we believe it was Origen, uh, who lived in the 200s. But this is what uh, uh, Photius said. He said, Paul's ancestors were from Gischala. But because his parents, together with many others of his race, were taken captive by the Roman spear, and Tarsus became their home where Paul was born. So Paul was not born in Israel. He was born in Tarsus, a Roman um, military and commercial hub city, uh, right on the Mediterranean, Tarsus. That's where Paul was born. But his family background were shaped by zealotry and slavery. In fact, Paul may have grown up as a slave in a slave family in Tarsus, which is an interesting concept to think about. It would explain why Paul has more to say about slavery and freedom than any other writer in the New Testament. He often uses that that, uh, common language. You think of the famous passage in in Romans chapter 7 when he talks about being slave to sin and how Jesus offers forgiveness and and, and freedom from that. And so just using all those type of terms would be very, uh, it it explains why he would, having grown up perhaps in that kind of a, a setting. It also explains passages like in Acts 22 when, uh, Paul is arrested near the end of his ministry, um, and uh, the Roman, the Roman uh, who had arrested him says, uh, the commander said to him, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. And, and then Paul responds, but, but I was born a citizen. I was born a citizen in Rome because he was born in this Roman uh, town of Tarsus, probably into a Roman family, right? Or slaves in, within a Roman family. In fact, some people have believed uh, believe that he had got the name Paul because of a, a guy named Aemilius Apollos, who was a very famous, influential Roman leader in Tarsus. And if he was a part of that family, it explains why he took the name Paul later on, which is interesting. 
Uh, something I should clarify a little bit. One of the foremost authorities in the world, on the ancient world and the slavery in the Roman Empire, he has this to say. Uh, James Jeffers says this, Roman citizens often freed their slaves in urban households. Uh, this frequently happened by the age of 30. We know that few slaves that reached uh, a, few, a few slaves that reached old age before gaining their freedom. So it wasn't a lifetime thing. They would serve for a while and often then were set free. Uh, another thing he says is that the slaves belonging to the household of the wealthy or moderate wealthy in some ways lived a better life than the free poor of the city. Unlike the free poor, such slaves were assured three meals a day lodging, clothing, and health care. And the reason I say this is something you have to understand about the, the, uh, the, the slavery in the time of Jesus. It was somewhat different than the Americanized slavery that we often think of. It's somewhere between the employment system that we have of today with employers and employees, which feels to some like slavery, but it also, it, it's somewhere in between the, uh, the American... Um, Slavery that is glorified in, 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 in Hollywood these days, and we hear stories and tragedies uh, of that, and, and the system we have today. So it, it, there, there's, there was a little more freedom. There was sometimes even more luxury. And as I said, if Paul was born into Aemilius Paulus' household, he could have been very well off. We know he got a very good education, and so probably was well uh, taken care of in this, in this family, that uh, his parents were were slaves in, uh, which is an, an interesting to think about because Paul himself was motivated and educated very well. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing, we talk about the slavery language Paul uses a lot. The other concept that comes out of this story was the zealotry. And we also see Paul talk a lot about zeal. In fact, if you were to give Paul, if you were to look at Paul and describe him, one of the words you would probably use would, this guy was so zealous for Jesus. Like he was passionate. He was sold out for Jesus, right? And that's why he says things like in Romans chapter 12, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. It was just part of his DNA, part of his family background, part of the neighborhood that his parents lived in that he heard about, never really having lived in, but but still a part of it, um, the zeal. And so we talked about it often. Another one in Galatians chapter 1, he said, I was advancing in Judaism, and this would be in his studies, uh, beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So he really latched on to, the, to his faith, uh, extremely zealous, he says, about the traditions, about the teachings about, in Judaism. If there was ever a Jew who knew the Word of God, it was me. I, I studied it. I was extremely zealous about it all. And then another one in Philippians chapter 3. Look how he describes himself. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's what good Jews do, right? And, and I, um, I'm of the people of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, there's a steam in that. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. If you, you want to, I was like as much, I was so Jewish, like I would make other Jews look like they weren't hardly Jewish. I was, I was the Hebrew of Hebrews. In regards to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, there's the word again, as for zeal, I was persecuting the church. I was trying to stomp out everything else that came up against Judaism. As for righteousness, based on the law, I was faultless. He said, and so this description, as you read it, and he wasn't bragging here, but he was, what he was trying to do is because he, he was being attacked and questioned about, was he really a Jew? You know, how can you be a Christian and still be faithful? And he says, I grew up steeped in this stuff. He says, I knew it inside and out. I was zealous. And so you sort of see that his background, if he was part of just Chala and, and that neighborhood and his parents and family and and he knew the stories, and he, I'm sure, heard the stories over his youth. You know, that influenced him, and it drove him. And like his ancestors, he was a man of, of great zeal and passion that drove him. Some scholars even doubted that Paul was a Roman. I mean, how could he be a Roman? He was so Jewish and so steeped in Judaism. And it's true you know, when you read the story in Acts 16, remember he's arrested and he's whipped and beaten for sharing Jesus? 
They throw him in prison. And then the next day he happens to mention, oh, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen. And they're like, oh, why didn't you tell us sooner? And they're all of a sudden treating him like a VIP and they pull him out of the jail and they give him the best of treatment and send him on his way. And it's like, and you wonder, well, why didn't you tell them that before you got whipped and beaten? Right? It's, it's like, that's strange. Why wouldn't he say something? And, and it's just like Paul he was so much trying to win the Jews that, that he wouldn't even bring up the fact that he was a Roman and, 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 and with, with Jews around because he was trying to connect with them first. Every time he went into a city, he was, he'd go to the synagogue, to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. And so if there were Jews around, he wouldn't want to raise that card. In fact, another story, when we referred to it earlier in, in a Acts 22, when he's in the temple in Jerusalem, and again he's arrested, and, and they're beating him, and they're trying to kill him, and the Romans come in and pull him out and throw him in jail, and then they find out he's a Roman citizen. And then instead of jail, they're now giving him a protective guard, right, and put him in, in, in and protect him. Uh, and you think, well, why didn't you say something sooner? Well, because I'm in Jerusalem. I'm trying to connect with the Jews. I'm trying to be a Jew. Yeah, I'm a Roman citizen, but I'm not going to use that to my um, benefit because I'm trying to connect with these people. And as you, you think about his story, you start to realize that this is what drove Paul. In fact, maybe the passage that clearest displays his zeal is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And let me just read those verses to you. He says this, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So again, you see him using this slave vocabulary. I am free. I belong to no one. I'm not a slave. And yet, I've made myself like a slave to everyone. And you think, why would anyone do that? Especially if you grew up as a slave, why would you ever want to go back to that? And he says, because I want to win as many as possible. Well, what do you mean, win? What does that mean? He goes on to explain to the Jews. I became like a Jew to win the Jews. I became like them, right? I, I did everything I could to connect with them to live among them, to relate to them. To the Jews, I became a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, that's under the Torah, the, the five books of the Old Testament that Moses wrote, to, uh, to those under the law that followed the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to, be, my, my purpose being, so that as to win those under the law, because I, I'm gonna, I want to relate to them. He goes on the next verse to say, to those not having the law, to those who have no regard for the law or don't live by the law, be Gentiles or non-believers, non he says, I became like one uh, not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, I still respect it and live under Christ's law to love one another. So he goes and says, so as to win those not having the law. My whole purpose is to win those who don't have the law those who don't know about God, those who don't know, I want to become one of them. Everything I do is about that. He goes in the next verse to say, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I became vulnerable. I got put myself in situations where I was hurting. And, and, and I did that so I could relate to those who are weak. In fact, he says, I have become all things to all people. Why? So that by all possible means, I might save some. I might win some to Jesus Christ. And that's what drove him. His zeal, his passion, everything about his life. That's why he uses that um, superlative over to, 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 I have become all things, all people, by all possible means, repeated three times. He said, in, in every way, you just see the zeal and his passion coming out. There's nothing more important I want to save people. And he concludes the passage by saying this, I do this, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share its blessings. The, the story of Jesus, I'm willing to do whatever it takes uh, to get people to hear about Jesus. 
And we know his story. He suffered a lot. He was shipwrecked and beaten, left for dead, um, traveled a lot. He, all he did, everything he did, he said, I did it because I wanted people to hear about Jesus. And that zeal that was a part of his family makeup, was part of his, his, his ancestors and his, his hometown and tradition, he carried it out except the zeal changed from, from anti-Rome to, uh, to preaching Christ to whoever, including the people in Rome. It's interesting how, as I looked at Paul's story, how his history shaped who he became. And the things that were part of his family, and what little we know, we know very little about his family, but you see them so clearly being shaped in his story, in, in his life. There's a strategy uh, that Jesus used. We call it the incarnational strategy. Incarnation means when Jesus took on flesh. That's what incarnation means. He took on flesh and lived among us. And Jesus did that because he wanted to show us God and show us the way to God. And so he became one of us. And in a sense, that's exactly what Paul was doing. He would, in every situation, he would become, if he's with Jews, he would become like a Jew because he wanted to relate to them. He wanted to understand them. And so he wanted to be a part of what they were doing and how they were thinking. And so he did everything he could to relate to them. Why? Because he wanted to have the opportunity to explain Jesus. And he knew that he, he needed a relationship. He needed to live amongst them. He couldn't force it. And so he incarnated. He became one of them. I was watching this week uh, a video from Samaritan's Purse, the um, relief agency, and their work that's going on in Ukraine uh, to this day, how they are still transporting food out to the front lines with great personal danger to themselves. When most people are feeling like it's too dangerous to go and do, there's the Church of Jesus Christ moving in and supplying food to the people on the front lines and uh, the people who are starving. And, and they're there. And I see the fearless church of Jesus Christ. You know, and it's like that boots on the ground mentality that's put the church at the forefront of those people's lives. And they're responding. And, and they're seeing the love of Christ. And it's making a difference in their community. It's that kind of living amongst them and, and, and so helping them in their time of need that's so powerful. When... Uh, when I started this church, one of the things that, that one of the first things that I did is I wanted a way of connecting with people in, in the community. So I looked at my skills and I said, what, what's, what, what's something I can do? And, and one of the things that I loved and, and was kind of my best sport was football. So I said, well, maybe I could use that for, for Jesus somehow. And so I joined a flag football league and ended up hanging out with a bunch of guys that didn't know Jesus. And and actually two of those guys, actually three, I guess, ended up uh, coming to this church. Um, and a couple of them even became Christians, which I thought was really cool. It was, it was through just using some talents or some skills that God had given me and said, how can I use this to kind of be a part of their lives and to build some trust and relationship with them? I, I read the story, too, this week of a cancer survivor who's using that story that they have in their past to now to minister to and, and encourage and, and help and bring hope to other people who are dealing with cancer. Because your history shapes you and shapes your ministry and, and puts you in a position, to, uh, a position of trust, a position, I've been there, uh, and I know what you're going through. I even read the story not long ago, too, about a person that was involved in the LGBTQ2 plus community and, and was now ministering in that community the hope of Jesus and the love of Jesus in that community. It's because they were a part of that, and they said, uh, I have a heart and a love for these people, and God's given me that history. And I wonder what history God has given you. Some of you think, oh, that, I don't want to go back there. I don't want to. How could God use that? Uh, but your history shapes you, right? It did the Apostle Paul. Uh, it, it certainly has for me, and, and Ray talked about that too in his story, that our history shapes who we become. And that's why Paul says in Philippians 1.1, he said this, Paul and Timothy, 
servants of Christ Jesus. You know what the actual word there is instead of servants? It's, the actual word is doulos. It means slave. The translators didn't want to put that in our Bible because it seemed too, too strong and harsh a word, so they used servants. But the actual word there is Paul and Timothy. We're slaves of Christ Jesus by choice. He hasn't made us slaves. We choose to serve him. We choose to, to be his bond servant or slave because in reality, he has freed us from sin. And living for him is the best way to go. And so they, they voluntarily put them, um, themselves back under slavery. And when, you, when you, you, you read Paul's story and you wonder, how could he ever do that? Or why would he think that way? Why would he want to return to that? And then you realize um, that shaped who he became. And he now sees and is so overwhelmed by what Christ has done for him. He says, I just want to serve. I want to be his slave. So that brings us to the, thre uh, to the threshold discussion. That was all kind of background. <laughs> so you see, I haven't got very far in my five thresholds. So we're going to come back to next week and the next week. We've got a few weeks. So I just want to introduce you to the first one. The first one is this. The first threshold that most people go through is this idea. They come to a place where they have to trust a Christian, right? where they trust somebody. It's common that most people, if you think back even in your story, there was somebody, it was a parent or a friend, or somebody that you trusted and said, I think their story, their, their testimony, what they did, I think I can trust this person. And if they're, they're a follower of Jesus, I might be interested in that too. One of the first things that makes people think about becoming a Christian is there needs to be someone they trust. Maybe it's a teacher in the, in the kids' church ministry area or, or a, a backyard camp, as, as uh, Ray talked about. But someone you feel like you can trust that they're not just selling you something, but they care about you. See, because our initial, as human beings, our initial reaction to people is to distrust, right? To question, to, to be uncertain about people. But in order to follow Christ... In a sense, we ultimately, to trust him, we often will start with trusting another Christian who's telling or living the story of Jesus. I find it's very interesting in the story of uh, Philemon in the Bible. Paul writes this letter to Philemon. And there's a, a servant. He's got a servant named Onesimus. And Onesimus, we think, maybe stole some money or something and then leaves and runs away which is like the death penalty. But he runs to Paul. And then Paul sends him back to Philemon, which is like really strange. But they're both believers in Jesus, and Paul appeals to that. But the thing that made me wonder, well, why did Onesimus run to Paul of all people? Why would a slave run to Paul? And, and it made me think that he must have known Paul cared, and maybe he even knew... Paul's background, and that Paul used to be a slave or brought up in a slave environment. And maybe he knew he could relate to that, and so he felt, here's someone I can trust, and he runs to Paul, becomes a follower of Jesus, and then goes back and is reunited with Philemon. It's a beautiful story, a powerful picture, but it, it's about learning to trust somebody, a messenger, before they can trust Jesus. So how do you do that? Three things, and I'll close with this. Awaken. Number one, how do you, how do you, if you want to have an impact, you want to help people come to know Jesus, maybe you need to awaken some of those things in your past. Maybe it's a skill, a talent, a, a, an event, or something in your past that can connect. There's a commonality. And you say, I've been there, I've done that, I've been through that. You awaken that memory, that history, that skill, and you use that to connect with people. They learn they can trust you because you've been there. The idea of among, that's how Jesus, that's the incarnational strategy, that Jesus came among them and, 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 and hung out with them. And Paul, that was his strategy. He says, I just want it to a Jew, I'm going to become a Jew. And he just lived and talked and, and, and worked in, in, in among them so they could see they could trust him by looking at his life. And then affirming. They, uh, you affirm them. You point out 
uh, and, and say positive things about him. You know, Christians tend to be, or can be judgmental towards others, but that never wins anyone to Jesus. And I'm not saying affirming their sin. I'm just saying affirm who they are. Affirm them and, and say positive things about them. I love how Paul does that in Acts 17 when he goes to Athens. He sees all these statues and he sees ones to the unknown God and he says, um, you know, it's great to see you, you people are seeking and you're, you're looking and, you, and you've even tried to cover all your bases by having this unknown God here. And he, he, the first thing he does is he affirms them. And, and it's a great approach. You want to be trusted? You find that commonality. Awaken some of the history. Walk among them. Live. Try to understand. Listen. And then affirm. And we do those. Um, we're, we're, we're helping the first step maybe of influencing and reaching the next generation or a friend or a co-worker to Jesus. Let's talk to God about that. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for uh, Paul's story. And just uh, we thank you for his passion and what drove him, a desire for other people to know Jesus. God, I, I sense that we have people in our lives that we would like to see come to know you also. And so, Lord, help us to be trustworthy. Help us to be people that care and love and, and, and just are willing to listen and be among those people so that we might have and fi find ourselves in a, an influential position, in a, in a place where we can have influence, that we can, we can stand up for you or say something for you. Lord, as we think about uh, our lives and our backgrounds, we recognize that you have uniquely created each one of us. And our history and our background uniquely positions us to reach somebody for the gospel. Put us in line with your working and your spirit. Allow us to be authentic and to use our stories to impact the people around us. And Lord, help us to be a light in our world for you. In Jesus' name, amen.